Tonight, We Can Keep You Forever presents fresh evidence to support claims that American servicemen may still be held as prisoners of war in Southeast Asia. Convinced that Americans do survive in captivity, Vietnam veteran Vincent Arnone plans a rescue mission into Laos. At a camp in Thailand, Arnone meets anti-communist Lao guerrillas. With them, he plans to liberate American POWs, held, he believes, across the Mekong River. I did not exclude in Laos that due to the, to the general inefficiency of the situation that there might be some left behind. No one disputes there were men alive on the ground who never returned. Mike Basilovac, whose F-105 crashed near Hanoi. Ron Dodge, filmed alive in Vietnam, whose body came back 15 years later. David Hardlicker, whose voice was heard on Pathet Lao radio, pleading for his release. We can keep you forever tonight at 9.30 on BBC One. Now on BBC One, Anne Robinson opens up the mail so that you can air your points of view. <laughs> Hello and good evening, and let's start with a very long letter from Gillian Hillstock of Ballymena, Northern Ireland. It might take the entire programme to read it out, but roughly it says, please, 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 42 times, then few, followed by please, 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 another 81 times, before ending... Could you tell me why points of view is so short? Couldn't you make it longer, please? Well, I suppose so, Gillian, if we chopped off the last ten minutes of Dallas and started the nine o'clock news at quarter past. But then a great many viewers would write lots and lots of very short, rude letters complaining points of view was far too long. But while we've got Gillian's attention, who, remember, is from Northern Ireland, she might like to get angry about this. We are hearing too many Ulster accents on TV these days. Well, a couple of them anyway. Writes Rudy Otter of Greenford, Middlesex. It all started with John Cole, the BBC's political correspondent, whom I'd always regarded as a token Ulsterman on the national scene. Now our children have another Ulster accent to contend with, a young lady on Blue Peter whose lilting voice is playing havoc with the Queen's English. Mr Otter ends... In fact, Miss Robinson, I've had more than enough of these attacks on the English language, and something ought to be done about it right now. Doreen Middleton of Pearlie, Surrey, also thinks in the interest of economy and clarity, Karen Keating of Blue Peter is unwelcome. We're always hearing how hard up the Beeb is, and yet to my amazement, just before Christmas, the Blue Peter programme had four presenters. I was always of the opinion that three were one too many, let alone four. Also, do you realise just how irritating the latest additional voice is? We cannot understand her, and it is so awful my daughter and I often switch off. Well, perhaps, Mrs Middleton, in and around the six counties of Northern Ireland, they shake their heads in confusion every time they hear a presenter who, like you, comes from Pearlie, Surrey, where, for those who don't know, they speak with a sort of posh South London wine. Anyway, while we're on the subject of knocking the regions, here's Steve Cowrow from Liverpool. Dear Anne Robinson, see, you got your name right. OK, you're an ex-liver bird, aren't you? Well, if you see Terry Wogan down any of those corridors of power, give him a go-along from us up here. He can't get away with calling us lazy, or so it seemed when he interviewed John Garnett on the 5th of January. Liverpool at the moment is going through the greatest financial cutbacks ever, and smart wisecracks from affluent southerners with Irish accents for a cheap laugh, well, frankly, we need it like a hole in the head. I'll just leave it to you, Anne, to whack him. Certainly. If you're watching Terry Wogan, be warned. More complaints of scouse bashing in Rockcliffe's Babies, the new Friday night series about a wide-eyed bunch of plainclothes PCs who make up Victor Tango division and frankly look as if they'd have trouble solving the Sun crossword, never mind a serious crime. But Mr Martin of Morton Will writes... In Rockcliffe's Babies, the Liverpool lad was cast as a blundering idiot while the London lad was a sharp, alert cop. Why are Liverpool people thought of as idiots by the southern scriptwriters? They have a bigger problem with crime and speech in the south. And Mr Martin ends with an undeniable truth. A lot of talented people have come from Merseyside. Let's move on to something viewers did like watching, in fact, like watching very much indeed. As I walked out one midsummer morning on BBC Two, the account of writer Laurie Lee's romantic 1930s journey to Spain. I was absolutely enthralled with the sheer simplicity of it all. 
Such a pleasant relief from all the trouble and strife in the world today. Writes Myrtle Eaton of Swindon. Jean Lansbury of Hatfield, Hertfordshire, was delighted with it too. Laurie Lee's crisp narrative did much to conjure up the pungent atmosphere of Slad and the beautifully photographed countryside. His detailed observations of Spain and its coarse conditions brought reality to the screen. Here was a brief sample of a truly faithful geographical experience which deserved to go on much longer. Well, plenty more letters like that, nearly all from female viewers, incidentally, and just one dissatisfied one, Jane Morlow of Hounslow, Middlesex. Being used to the book, one of the main points of it is the constant stream of amusing anecdotes, characters and situations that extract a chuckle a minute from the reader. Not so the TV version. What a shame to put off all those who haven't read the book by doing it such an injustice. Well, Miss Morlow, if you can now put your hands over your eyes, the rest of us can enjoy another glimpse of As I Walked Out One Midsummer Morning. After leaving Toledo and its austere and intimate glories, I headed down for the sea. Spending almost a month on the road, travelling in easy stages, I'd been glad to be back on my solitary marches, edging mindlessly from village to town, sleeping in thickets, in oases of rushes, under tall reeds to the smell of water. South of Toledo, there was green country still, green trees against brick-red earth. Trees so intense, they seem to throw green shade and turn the dust around them to grass. That was John Wilde as the young Laurie Lee and the voice of Laurie Lee himself from As I Walked Out One Midsummer Morning. Now, Filthy Rich and Cat Flap, the new comedy series from The Young Ones, has brought in a big post bag too, divided, judging from the handwriting of a few who gave their edge, between the under-twenties who think it fab, brill, ace and cool, and those with bus passes who consider disgusting lavatory humour has no business on television. Here's Nicholas Stanrod of Rotherham to speak for the younger generation. Brilliant comedy, Filthy Rich and Cat Flap. I couldn't stop laughing. The script was excellent, the gags perfect. Just looking at the expressions on their faces made me go into a laughing fit. Not so V. Whitehead of Falmouth Cornwall who says... We are trying to keep violence under control, but they are trying to make it a laughing matter and making a very, very bad job of it. Much the same sentiments from Miss H. Roberts of Waterloo, Merseyside. I don't think I can be accused of being a prude or of taking life too seriously, but quite honestly, I fail to see that constant references to willies and breaking wind, punctuated by ooers, can be classed as adult humour. I thought that was all outgrown by the end of primary school. On the other hand, some young folk are apparently disgusted with the behaviour of South Fork's most famous female pensioner, Margaret Abernethy of Great Yarmouth leaps to her defence. I found in Dallas Miss Ellie's kisses to be quite beautiful, yet described in the press as yuck. Isn't it sad that younger journalists find it distasteful for us older folk to kiss? I agree, Mrs Abernethy, but if Miss Ellie's seamy sex life is to continue, I think we should seriously consider having a whip round so she can go to the hairdressers. I don't know the age of Mary Louise Richard of West Sussex, but she appears to be in love. What a delicious man Robert Kilroy Silk is. What a joy to see him every weekday. But please, could we have his programme a little later? Five past nine is rather early to get myself organised. Dressed, made up, bed made, etc. I must look my best in case he sees me when I settle down for 40 minutes of his programme. There's more. What a gorgeous man. This is my motto. If you want your days to be honey and milk, start each one with Kilroy Silk. <laughs> I love him. At this point, I may as well admit that after last week's programme, I myself felt like writing a letter of undying devotion to Mr Andrew Fridkin of Boreham Wood, who very kindly found and returned my lost earring. If you missed last week's points of view, sorry, no time for explanations, I'm afraid. Just many thanks, Mr Fridkin, and on with the letters. You might remember also last week a viewer was complaining about Neighbours, the Australian soap opera. Well, to balance that out, a stream of protests from those back at school who feel cheated that they now miss every episode. I'm writing to tell you that I love watching Neighbours. Writes Lisa Smith, age 12, of Cannock in Staffordshire. But the only time I get to see it is in the holidays. Not everyone has a video. Could you put it on at a different time, like 4.30? And Tom Pryor of Thussington, Leicestershire, caught the programme while he was snowed in. Just one programme made the days off school worthwhile. Neighbours. The icicles dropped from my nose as the opening titles appeared. 
And again from last week, teach you not to miss the programme, remember Miss Norris Simmons in plaster, in hospital, and not at all amused by the hilarious ski programme on the piste. What a surprise for my wife and children to hear me referred to as Miss Simmons. Please, please put the record straight. You're still in plaster, Norris Simmons, father of three. Finally, a word or two about Jazz Week, which was hugely enjoyed and appreciated by jazz fans everywhere. So good was it, in fact, that we've heard from a few new jazz fans. Here's one. Mere hyperbole can only fail to express the sheer jaw-dropping amazement with which I've just viewed the amazingly fluent, comprehensive and utterly modest talent in the programme Dick Hyman plays, part of BBC Two's current Jazz Week series. Writes P. Johnson of Runcorn Cheshire, who goes on. Whenever asked about my musical preferences, I've always claimed total open-mindedness, with the exception of jazz. Yet on hearing only the final four or five pieces from Dick Hyman's selection, I've been totally converted by his brilliant, sparkling style. And on that note, I'll say goodnight and let Dick Hyman swing us through the credits. And by the way, if you've written to me about Anzacs, look in next week. If you have any comments on BBC television programmes, please write to Points of View, BBC Television, London W12 8QT. Points of view about all television programmes are also welcomed by open air at 11.35 tomorrow morning when the BBC's Director of Programmes, Michael Grade, will be in the studio to answer your calls. The number to contact 061 814 0424. There's an hour of comedy starting shortly on BBC Two with MASH followed by Filthy Rich and Cat Flap. Here on one in half an hour, a documentary about American troops missing in Vietnam. It can keep you forever. Here on BBC One. The nine o'clock news from the BBC with Julia Somerville and Andrew Harvey. violent death of Constable Blakelock. The prosecution say the rioters wanted to hack off his head. The stabbing of Catherine Humphrey. A man is arrested. The Guinness affair. Gerald Ronson pays back over five million pounds. Terry Waite in Beirut. Still no sign of him after 28 hours. And the play, a London theatre found too upsetting to stage. Good evening. A jury at the Old Bailey has been hearing a horrific account of how Constable Keith Blakelock was killed during a night of rioting at Tottenham in North London 15 months ago. His attackers, it was claimed, planned to cut off his head and stick it on a pole to taunt the police. Six people are charged with murdering PC Blakelock. All plead not guilty. Three of the accused are juveniles. One is 14, the other two 15. Because of their age, they can't be named. The adult defendants are Winston Silkert, Mark Braithwaite and Engin Raghip, all from North London. Today in court, the prosecution has been describing how a group of police officers were ambushed and trapped by a mob of around 200 people, how PC Blakelock tripped and fell and was hacked to death. For eight days during legal arguments, the three accused men had been arriving at court in a prison van to join the three juveniles with whom they're accused of murdering PC Blakelock. Of the six defendants, four are black and two white. For the Crown, Mr Roy Amlot described how PC Blakelock had died while trying to protect firemen attempting to reach a blazing supermarket at the height of the riot. The officer had tripped and fallen when they were chased by a mob of youths. He was pounced on by a large mob, said Mr Amlot. They were seen kicking, punching and wielding weapons. It was a brutal attack and he had no chance. PC Blakelock suffered 40 slash and stab wounds, including half a dozen deep cuts to the head, inflicted by a machete or an axe-like weapon, which appeared to have been used as if to sever the heads of Mr. Amlot. 
a knife was found embedded six inches in the officer's neck. Mr Amlot said the murder of PC Blakelock had followed a build-up intention of Broadwater Farm after the death of Mrs Cynthia Jarrett during a police raid. By the following evening, barricades were being erected, vehicles set alight, and the police themselves were being bombarded with missiles. At about 10 p.m., firemen escorted by a 12-strong squad of policemen had tried and failed to reach the supermarket blaze. Of the attack on BC Blakelock, Mr Amlot said one of the accused juveniles had told the police they were trying to cut his head off. I looked away because I felt sick. They said they were going to put it on a pole and plant it in front of the police. Mr Amlot told the court that the youth said that he was forced to accept a sword and inflict cuts on PC Blakelock after one of the ringleaders had seen him standing nearby. Mr Amlot said, however, that the youth had later withdrawn the statement, saying he'd given it under pressure from the police. The case continues. Detectives in Kent investigating the stabbing of 10-year-old Catherine Humphrey are tonight still questioning a man arrested early today. Catherine herself remains critically ill from multiple stab wounds, but her description of what happened last Friday has helped the police to make rapid progress in their search for her attacker. By chance, it was as we were filming in the police incident room yesterday afternoon that news came through of a significant development. Forensic scientists had found fingerprints on some of Catherine's belongings, like her earmuffs, and most notably, a plastic carrier bag. Every police force in the country was alerted. Detectives from Kent travelled to London to observe a house in Clapham. This morning, they went into a flat in that house. A man was arrested and taken to a nearby police station. Kent police said a 27-year-old man was helping with their inquiries. Two hours later, he was driven into the yard of Margate Police Station and covered in a blanket, he was accompanied to police cells where he's still being interviewed. Tonight, Catherine Humphrey remains in intensive care. She's breathing without a ventilator and though her doctors say she's still very poorly, her condition is gradually improving. There's been a new twist to the Guinness saga tonight. Heron International, a company run by Gerald Ronson, has paid back over £5 million to Guinness. Mr Ronson says the money was given to Heron in return for supporting Guinness's share price during last year's takeover bid for distillers. Guinness's former chairman and chief executive Ernest Saunders is implicated in the arrangements. Guinness's new management team met today to catch up on the long overdue business of running the company, but found themselves with a pleasant surprise. Last night, the nine o'clock news revealed that a company in Gerald Ronson's Heron Group was on the confidential list of those who'd received payments from Guinness, apparently to do with share purchases during the distillers' takeover. Today, Mr Ronson returned £5.8 million to Guinness. He said Heron had agreed to spend £25 million supporting the Guinness share price during the bid at the request of a representative of eminent brokers acting for Guinness. He said, I should not have succumbed to the request for support. He said the arrangements were expressly confirmed to me by Mr Ernest Saunders. And it didn't cross his mind that city advisers and business people of such eminence would be asking them to join in doing something improper. We understand the Guinness board under Sir Norman Macfarlane is now putting pressure on other business and city names on the list to do the same before taking further action. James Long reporting. A junior official at the Office of Fair Trading is suspected of illegally passing on inside information. This was confirmed by the Trade Secretary Paul Channon, who also said he intended to raise the maximum penalty for insider dealing to seven years in jail. In a speech tonight, Mr Channon said the government guaranteed it would take action to eradicate financial fraud and malpractice. We are taking very energetic action. We have a whole host of inquiries. We are going to spare, take, spare no steps to try and get rid of this problem once and for all. I can't say we'll achieve it once and for all, but we will. there are a lot of inquiries going on and we will uh, uh, pursue them. And we will, if we get people, if we catch people, we will bring them to book. The Archbishop of Canterbury's special envoy, Terry Waite, hasn't been seen publicly in Beirut for more than 24 hours, and there are reports that he may have gone to meet some hostages. Mr Waite arrived in Lebanon nine days ago to try to negotiate the release of some of the foreigners being held there. He left his hotel last night, and nothing has been heard from him since. 
Since Mr Waite's arrival, three more Westerners have been kidnapped, the latest today. After his week of high-profile and fruitless meetings with Lebanese leaders, it's 28 hours now since Terry Waite left his seafront hotel and vanished. His bodyguards stopped anyone following, but today one of them said Mr Waite was meeting with some of the hostages. So it looks as though after the frustrations and disappointments of the past week, Mr Waite might be making progress. Speculation on who he's seeing centers on two Americans, Terry Anderson and Tom Sutherland, Londoner John McCarthy, and Belfast-born Brian Keenan. But until Mr. Waite reappears, we won't know what, if anything, he's been able to achieve. And meanwhile, another West German, engineer Alfred Schmidt, has been kidnapped, the second German taken this week. So as of now, there are still 20 foreigners held by the kidnappers. This is Keith Graves for the 9 o'clock news in Cyprus. South African security forces have begun a widespread hunt in the Durban area after 12 black people were shot dead in a nearby township. Seven of them were children. This report from Michael Burke in Johannesburg has been compiled under South African censorship laws. The gunmen surrounded Mr Ntuli's house shortly after midnight. They kicked in the door and ran through the room, spraying them with automatic weapons fire. The adults were killed here as they slept, a 10-year-old boy escaped by hiding in a cupboard. In a hut nearby, the gunman found five children aged under seven. They killed them all. A massacre, one of the worst incidents in the politicized violence that swept this country in the last three years and claimed over 2,000 lives. These shootings seem part of a struggle for power in Natal's black communities. Kwamakuta is in the so-called black homeland of KwaZulu, ruled by the Zulu leader, Chief Mangasutu Butulezi. Though an opponent of apartheid, he's regarded by militant blacks as a collaborator with the white-led government here. His conservative political movement in Qatar is involved in an increasingly bloody struggle with radical supporters of the United Democratic Front. Clashes between the two movements have claimed dozens of lives, including recently several Inkata supporters in Kwamakuta. One of Mr. Ntuli's sons is a local UDF leader. He survived but was arrested by the police later in the day. The other son heard the attack on his family. There were many. And how long were they here for? Just quickly. What? Two minutes. And they, they, ch they took 30 minutes. Faction fighting in this area now seems endemic. Government sources say the killers were probably ANC terrorists because they used communist-made AK-47 weapons. But local people accused Inkata. Tonight, Chief Butalezi said he was shocked, but he had no control over his supporters retaliating in a vendetta. This is Michael Burke for the 9 o'clock news in South Africa. The telephone engineers dispute is now affecting most parts of the country. Today, Britain's international exchanges and satellite stations were hit, and the actions begun to affect the city. There have been walkouts in many areas. The engineers' unions say about 30,000 engineers are staging a 24-hour strike in London and the West Country, while another 60,000 are locked out elsewhere. The union expects that none of its 110,000 telecom members will be working by the weekend. The union says more than 30,000 engineers joined today's 24-hour strike. That includes all its members in London and the West Country. And they're unlikely to be back at work tomorrow. Like colleagues in most areas of the country, they'll turn up as usual. But they'll refuse to sign an undertaking to work normally. So they'll be sent home by the management. Television news was one of the first areas to be affected by the dispute, with both the BBC and ITN having trouble getting video reports fed into London on British telecom circuits. But BT says most of its 21 million customers haven't been hit. There hasn't been much effect so far, and clearly one can expect that in the longer term the service is going to deteriorate. If there is a strike, it means we cannot undertake new work but the rest of the system is fairly resilient and will stand up for a long while. The real problems will arise if the dispute becomes protracted. More and more faults are likely to go unrepaired, and this could hit key areas where telecommunications are vital. The growing use of telecommunications links by business means the engineers' dispute could have a serious effect. In the city, almost all trading is now handled by phone or VDU screen. If this were to go on for any significant length of time, then I do actually think that the city would, uh, would be unable to transact business. 
If the dispute continues, faults which are not repaired could delay business far beyond London. The money markets operate around the clock, and the breakdown could hit international deals worth millions of pounds. Legal documents dispatched throughout Britain and abroad could also fall victim to any telecommunications breakdown. Information now sent instantly by facsimile machine, like the pages of the independent newspaper for printing, would have to go by post or by road. A spokesman for the paper said they could continue printing at all their plants except for Bradford, which would affect distribution in the north. The holiday trade, now right in the middle of its busiest booking period, could face difficulties in getting customers the holidays they want. High street travel agents rely on phone lines and computer terminals to get details of what's still available. A fault could mean thousands of would-be holidaymakers having to wait for confirmation of the holiday they want. British Telecom say they can't hazard a guess as to how many faults are likely to show up while the dispute continues. But they fear that domestic consumers with just one phone are likely to be hit first. The Health Secretary, Norman Fowler, spent several minutes today at the bedside of an AIDS victim in San Francisco. Mr Fowler's on a week-long visit to the United States to learn how Americans are coping with the disease. He said afterwards that AIDS victims deserve care and compassionate treatment. This morning, Mr. Fowler visited a housing project for AIDS victims displaced from their homes. It was the end of an intensive three-day tour of all the issues of AIDS, as San Francisco knows them, in their acutest form. This is a, this is a four-person. Yeah. One idea he's unlikely to adopt is the American public education program, where the television networks will allow only the blandest AIDS commercials. We all have the responsibility to play our part. AIDS. Fight the fear with the facts. But the time that'll surely live with him longest was his visit to San Francisco General, the hospital that turns nobody away. It's the center of AIDS treatment here and the place where Mr. Fowler had his first meeting ever with a hospitalized AIDS patient. Ken Gifford is a homosexual and former drug user. Many of his friends have died of the disease. He now has it himself, but he was well enough to receive his British visitor. And this is the visitor I was telling you about, Hi, Mr. Powell. How are you? I'm fine, sir. The patient was recovering from a bout with pneumonia, but no one yet has ever recovered from AIDS. He spoke to the minister about the treatment he's getting here, and both of them were happy to oblige the cameras. I can actually kneel down if you that's like. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. That's, that's fine. <laughs> so. Sorry, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry about this, but, uh, it's okay. Right, indeed. Sure. But I wish you luck. Well, thank you. You're going home tomorrow. That's the plan, yeah. That's the plan, yeah. and you're looking forward to that. Absolutely. It'll be, it'll be real nice to go back into the real world, as it were. Right, thank you. Well, thanks very much for talking. And You're welcome. I wish you, wish you, wish you luck. Thank you. Ward 5A was left to its nurses and its patients as Mr. Fowler's tour continued. His immediate reaction? Uh, it, 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 it is, I think, it, it is an impressive man. He is, um, he is cheerful, and he is looking forward, and. Um, I think that that is um, impressive from his personal, personal point of view. Inside the ward, the patient was talking of his earlier life. And it was a good time. It was, you know, reckless abandon, and it probably was very irresponsible. But it was a good time, and we thought nothing of having casual sex or of using recreational drugs. Didn't even give it a second thought. But, you know, when you lose a lot of your friends or a lover, you know, or eventually when it hits the heterosexual community, it will be children and wives and things like that. It wakes you up. I'm not really clinging to the idea that they're going to have a cure, you know. I am, uh, I am hopeful. I, I, think that, uh, I think that if I can maintain my health for another couple of years, that there's probably a much greater chance that there'll be at least life-extending drugs mm -hmm. for AIDS patients. But by the statistical average of these cases, he has about one year to live. This is Martin Bell for the 9 o'clock news in San Francisco.
An inquest jury has been hearing about the events leading to the death of Michael Lush, who died last November while rehearsing a stunt for the Noel Edmonds Late Late Breakfast Show. He fell more than 100 feet. The inquest was told that the BBC ignored advice from experts not to go ahead with the stunt. The inquest jury heard how the BBC chose contestants for Noel Edmonds' Late Late Breakfast Show, the programme since scrapped after the tragedy. Michael Lush was a random choice among thousands of volunteers for a whirly wheel challenge, selected for a stunt called Hang 'em High. Excited, he wanted to be a superstar but was apprehensive, and a rehearsal ended in disaster after he was hoisted up 120 feet inside a metal box suspended from a crane. He wore a safety harness with an elasticated rope attached to a mountaineer's clip, which should have broken his fall. Instead, he plunged straight to the ground and was killed instantly. His girlfriend, Alison Toop, entered him for the stunt and was reassured after being told the BBC had employed Mr. Paul Matthews, said to be one of the best stuntmen, as an advisor. The mother of Michael Lush, Mrs. Vera Lush, said she had met Mr. Matthews with her son 24 hours before the fatal fall. She was worried about her son's safety, and Michael had asked, you're not going to smash me all over the pavement in front of thousands of viewers, are you? She said Mr. Matthews had laughed and replied, it's safer than a parachute jump, that everything would be all right, one rope would be sufficient, it had been tested and tested. When someone else had commented, I think you are mad, absolutely mad, Mr. Matthews had replied, we stuntmen are mad, aren't we, Michael? BBC researcher Janet Covington said she didn't know the stuntman had never done a jump using elasticated rope in his life, or even a parachute jump. The inquest continues tomorrow. One man was killed and two others were seriously injured in a multiple crash on the M2 in Kent. Their car became wedged under a lorry which then burst into flames. The accident happened in thick fog on the London-bound carriageway of the motorway near Maidstone. The transport minister who went to the scene said many people were driving too fast. Greater Manchester's chief constable, James Anderton, withdrew from a visit to the city by the Duchess of Gloucester today. He said media attention surrounding his claims that he's guided by God would be embarrassing for her. His place was taken by his deputy, John Stalker, who's retiring from the force in March after reported disagreements with Mr Anderton. Teachers in Scotland look set to end their two and a half year long pay dispute. Members of the largest teaching union, the Educational Institute of Scotland, have voted to accept a new deal on pay and conditions. It means an average pay rise of 16.4% over 18 months. The Court of Appeal in London is about to hear a series of cases which will have far reaching implications for women's pay. All four cases are being brought by women claiming equal pay with male colleagues on the grounds that their jobs are of equal value. Tomorrow, the judges hear the case of Julie Haywood, a cook claiming parity with male shipyard workers. But the most important case is that of Renee Pixton, who's taking her employer's Freeman's mail order to court. Renee Pickstone is out to deal a blow for working women. She's paid the same as the men doing her job, but she's not satisfied with that. She looked across the factory floor to men doing a different job and getting more money than her. And she decided her work was just as important. Well, it just didn't feel right to me. I didn't think right about it. I just, I just thought, you know, well, here I am doing this job. It's not really like what that man's doing. But there again, it's just as good as, as what my job is. And I thought, well... I know that he's getting four pounds a week more or less, more than what I'm getting, and I feel that I should have that. Freeman's management say Mrs Pickstone's claim isn't valid because men are doing the same job as her, and if she got a pay rise, it would cause chaos. If in this case it went forward and the tribunal found in her favour, then the men who got left behind, they would claim sexual discrimination they would leapfrog upwards, then all the people who were earning more would, of course, say they had lost their differentials. There would then be chaos. Mrs Pickstone isn't alone in testing the law. Julie Haywood, a cook at Camel Laird, goes to court tomorrow asking for the same pay as shipyard workers. And three speech therapists have put in a claim which, if successful, would knock on to thousands of other health service workers. 
So the coming weeks will show whether women workers can make significant gains or find the law isn't on their side. John Fryer reporting. The West German tennis star Boris Becker is parting company with one of the men who helped him to win two Wimbledon singles titles. His trainer, Gernto Bosch, says he's quitting because he can no longer put up with Becker's attitude during training. Yesterday, Becker was knocked out of the Australian Open by an unseeded player and fined $2,000 for misbehaviour on court. The Royal Court Theatre in London has cancelled performances of a play which makes controversial allegations about the role of some Jews during the Holocaust. The play, called Perdition, claims that during the war Zionist or nationalist Jews collaborated with the Nazi extermination programme. The play, which was due to start tomorrow, has been described by Jewish groups as inaccurate and anti-Semitic, Peter Gould reports. The play was due to run for five weeks at the Royal Court and tickets had been selling well. It's a courtroom drama but refers to real life events in wartime Hungary when half a million Jews were rounded up by the Nazis and sent to their deaths at Auschwitz. That much is undisputed history, but the play accuses Zionist Jews of collaborating with the Nazis' extermination program. It claims they accepted the Holocaust because they thought it would help create the state of Israel once the war was over. Today, the Board of Deputies of British Jews joined protests against the production. The suggestion that Jews, Zionists, or whatever way you use it, ever collaborated with the Nazis is a foul travesty of, 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 of the facts. The Royal Court maintain the play is neither inaccurate nor anti-Semitic, but they say they decided to cancel it because they realise it would have caused distress. However, the actors believe the public should have been allowed to make up their own minds. There is absolutely no anti-Jewish sentence or statement in this play whatsoever. No actor like myself or any other of my colleagues in this play would take part in any play which was in the least bit anti-Semitic in its intention, and Perdition certainly is not. And tonight, the director and cast of Perdition are looking for another theatre that will stage the play. And tonight's main news again, the trial of six people accused of murdering PC Keith Blakelock during the Tottenham riots has been told his attackers planned to cut his head off and put it on a pole to taunt other police. Detectives in Kent investigating the stabbing of Catherine Humphrey are still questioning a man arrested early today in London. There's still no sign of church envoy Terry Waite. More than 24 hours after he left his Beirut hotel, apparently to meet foreign hostages and their kidnappers. And that's the national and international news tonight. Good night. Good night. Now the North West News. Mr James Anderton, the Chief Constable of Greater Manchester, didn't take part in today's visit to Manchester by the Duchess of Gloucester. He said he didn't want to cause her embarrassment because he would have been the subject of inordinate attention from the media. Tomorrow, Mr Anderton has talks at the Home Office about his recent statements on AIDS and his religious beliefs. A group of people calling themselves the New Patriotic Movement held a rally in Albert Square in the centre of Manchester today to support the Chief Constable. They carried placards saying Anderton is right and said if people didn't show support, Mr Anderton could be forced from office. British Telecom say the engineers' strike is causing a backlog of phone repairs. In Cumbria, phones at the RAC offices in Carlisle have been out of order since Monday. That means stranded motorists can't call for help. Hundreds of Telecom clerical workers joined striking engineers in Lancashire and Cumbria today. A senior official at British Nuclear Fuel says some Sellafield workers contaminated by a radiation leak may have received doses of radioactivity higher than the permitted level, but the extent of the contamination won't be known until detailed tests have been carried out on the 12 men involved. A grandmother of 58 has been sent to prison for a year after admitting drawing her dead mother's pension for 10 years. A court in Manchester was told that Mrs Edna Wright from Old Trafford defrauded the DHSS of more than £23,000. The judge said he was sorry to send a woman of her age to prison, but it was a serious offence. At Bury, the District Health Authority has agreed to pay nearly £10,000 to a woman who became pregnant after an operation to sterilise her. Six months after the treatment, she, was found, she found she was having a baby.
Now the weather, overcast and misty with fog after dark, some drizzle on hills and near the coast, and a mild night. Tomorrow, little change with mist and fog thinning around lunchtime. It'll be dry and mild again, temperatures reaching 6 degrees Celsius, that's 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Hello to you. Well, the weather's in a fair... a good deal of fog especially on the eastern side but with the pressure fairly uniform across the country an ideal night to set your barometers and if you want to go out tapping this is what you should be seeing up in Shetland the pressure about 1028 millibars or 30.38 inches down in eastern parts of England 1038 millibars converts to 30.65 inches and the highest pressure across the country in Wales 1040 millibars 30.71 inches well, as I said, the weather's not changing very much by uh, this time tomorrow. The high pressure will have drifted a little bit further northwestwards, and as uh, time goes by, you'll find it pushing just that little bit further north as well. So by the weekend, we'll start to see a slight change, and it looks as though we'll be getting a northwesterly drift on the eastern side of the country. This will have two slight effects. It'll mean it won't be quite as mild in the north, and it looks as though this northwesterly could well be clearing up the low cloud and the mist and fog that we've got in many parts. In fact, it is a very misty foggy evening outside, some thick and dense fog on the eastern side, and as we go through the night, that fog thickening up in many parts of the country too. But one good thing, in most places it'll stay above freezing, even down in the southeast, up to, uh, down to about one degree Celsius. But uh, I do think there could be a chance in Jersey that the temperature might just get down below freezing, but uh, I really don't think uh, there's too much of a chance of that now. But on the near continent, certainly a very cold night indeed. So a very foggy start in most places tomorrow, difficulty driving around, particularly on the eastern side. And it is in the snow fields of East Anglia and the southeast where I think we could keep some fog patches right the way through the day. But for many places, brightening up a brighter day, perhaps in the western Midlands, the brightest day of all may well be in the eastern parts of Scotland. But for many of us, a good deal of cloud, perhaps a little bit of drizzly stuff around, but not very much. It's going to be another very mild day you can see up in the northwest, and certainly milder in the southeast than we've had for some time. That's it for me then. A very good night, dear. Felicity Kendall is the mistress tomorrow at nine o'clock on BBC Two in another slice of gentle comedy by Carl Elaine. I don't even know what my shoulder blades look like. They're like little wings. I think you must have been a sparrow in a previous life. Ah. One of them sticks out more than the other. I think you must have broken it or something. Sticks out? You mean they're not the same? You mean one actually sticks out? More than the other, yeah. You never told me. I must look very odd from behind. Well, only when you stand sideways. What happens when I stand sideways? <laughs> well, it's as though you've got a little... pump. That's all right. <laughs> At 9.30 on BBC One, Bread. More comedy from Carla Lane. The story of the Boswell family. Oh, I tell Grandad, the eggs are not free range, but the hens that laid them run around in a shed. <laughs> Two comedies from Carla Lane tomorrow evening on BBC Television. We'll be right at home. In Sports Night tonight at 10.45 on BBC One, Littlewoods Cup Soccer, Motorsport Awards and four-man bobsleigh action from the World Championships at Sam Moritz. Fourteen years ago, President Nixon announced that all American prisoners in the Vietnam War had been brought home. Now on BBC One, a documentary which challenges that, with evidence suggesting many were in fact left behind. We can keep you forever.